Hi, I'm Hannah, and <laughs> I have crazy hair. We'll try this again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Editing that. Um, so, my name is Casey, and this is my sister, Hannah. Hello! <laughs> and we are the non-existent story, a game of storytelling and story listening and story writing um, in which one person summarizes a story that exists, that is to say that it has been published, and reads a passage from that story, also existent, and then reads another summary of a story that does not exist, or not yet, and a passage from that non-existent story. But we don't know which is which, and so my job as the listener and uh, interlocutor is to guess. And there will be prizes or some sort of consequence at some point that we should talk about. Uh, but uh, for this, our third technically episode, Hannah will be uh, the storyteller and I will be the story listener. So whenever you're ready. Summary one. A controversy of great philosophical and literary import rages in mid 15th century Europe. As with so many controversies in this time, it wages between seven or eight Anglo-Saxon men with very recognizable names, which I will refrain from recognizing. These men are educated enough to be literate, powerful enough to get published, and largely ignored by a European population too illiterate to read their papers, which they couldn't afford to purchase anyway. The question is of superiority, and the lines are drawn between the camp of science and reason, here called moderns, and the camp of Greek and Roman classical philosophy, here called ancients. And so the controversy builds in unread papers, and these very important men get very passionate. And finally, the written word takes it upon itself to resolve the matter. Books from both camps meet for blows in the King's Library. Lesser known critical works arrive in force to support numerous allies and attack still more numerous adversaries. There is talk of negotiations, there is political intrigue. Secret alliances are bound together and shredded apart. But alas, all pretense is illuminated, and so begins a furious assault. The fight, depicted in epic style reminiscent of Homer's Iliad, also present, is interrupted when an unrelated altercation between a spider and a bee, perched high above the fray on the library floor, distracts the books. The books below pause to observe this fascinating debate, but return promptly to the fight at its conclusion. Pages fly, ink splashes, and the ground is littered with the back bindings of the fallen. It is unclear by the end which camp is victorious. Now I will read my excerpt from this real or imaginary story I've just described, which will be accompanied by Johann Sebastian Bach's Harpsichord Concerto in D minor, 1052. Upon the highest corner of a large window, there dwelt a certain spider, swollen up to the first magnitude by the destruction of infinite numbers of flies, whose spoils lay scattered before the gates of his palace, like human bones before the cave of some giant. The avenues to his castle were guarded with turnpikes and palisados, all after the modern way of fortification. After you had passed several courts, you came to the center, wherein you might behold the constable himself on his lodgings, which had windows fronting to each avenue, and ports to sally out upon all occasions of prey or defense. In this mansion, he had for some time dwelt in peace and plenty, with danger to his person by swallows from above, or to his palace by rooms from below, non-existent. When it was the pleasure of fortune to conduct thither a wandering bee to whose curiosity a broken pane in the glass had discovered itself. And in he went, where expatiating a while, he at last happened to alight upon one of the outward walls of the spider's citadel, which yielding to the unequal weight, sunk down to the very foundation. Thrice he endeavored to force his passage, and thrice the center shook. The spider within, feeling the terrible convulsion, supposed at first that nature was as approaching to her final dissolution, or else that Beelzebub, with all his legions, was come to revenge the death of many thousands of his subjects, 
whom his enemy had seen. However, at length, he valiantly resolved to issue forth and meet his fate. Meanwhile, the bee had acquitted himself of his toils and posted securely at some distance, was employed in cleansing his wings and disengaging them from the ragged remnants of the cobweb. By this time, the spider was adventured out, when beholding the chasms and ruins and dilapidations of his fortress, he was very near after his wit's end. He stormed and swore like a madman and swelled till he was ready to burst. At length, casting his eye upon the bee, and wisely gathering causes from the events, for they knew each other by sight. A plague spit you, said he, for a giddy son of a whore. Is it you with a vengeance that has made this litter here? Could you not look before you and be damned? Do you think I have nothing else to do in the devil's name but to mend and repair after your arse? Good words, friend, said the bee, having now pruned himself and being disposed to droll. I'll give you my hand and word to come near your kennel no more. I was never in such a confounded pickle since I was born. Sirrah, replied the spider, if it were not for breaking an old custom in our family never to stir abroad against the enemy, I should come and teach you better manners. I pray have patience, said the bee, or you will spend your substance and, for aught I see, you may stand in need of it all toward the repair of your house. Rogue, rogue, replied the spider, yet methinks you should have more respect to a person whom all the world allows to be so much your betters. By my troth, said the bee, the comparison will amount to a very good jest, and you will do me a favor to let me know the reasons that all the world is pleased to use in so hopeful a dispute. At this, the spider, having swelled himself into the size and posture of a disputant, began his argument in the true spirit of controversy, with resolution to be heartily scurrilous and angry, to urge his own reasons without the least regard to the answers or objections of his opposite, and fully predetermined in his mind against all conviction. Not to disparage myself, said he, by the comparison with such a rascal, what art thou but a vagabond without house or home, without stock or inheritance, born to no possessions of your own but a pair of wings and a drone pipe? Your livelihood is a universal plunder of nature, a freebooter over fields and gardens, and for the sake of stealing, will rob a nettle as readily as a violet. Whereas I am a domestic animal, furnished with a native stock within myself, this large castle to show my improvements in mathematics, is all built with my own hands and the materials extracted altogether out of my own person. I am glad, answered the bee, to hear you grant at least that I am come honestly by my wings and my voice, for then it seems I am obliged to heaven alone for my flights and my music. And Providence would never have bestowed on me two such gifts without designing them for the noblest ends. I visit, indeed, all the flowers and blossoms of the field and garden, but whatever I collect from thence enriches myself without the least injury to their beauty, their smell, or their taste. Now, for you and your skill in architecture and other mathematics, I have little to say. In that building of yours, there might, for aught I know, have been labor and method enough, but by woeful experience for us both, is too plain, the materials are not, and I hope you will henceforth take warning and consider duration and matter as well as method and art. You boast, indeed, of being obliged to no other creature, but of drawing and spinning out all from yourself. That is to say, if we may judge of the liquor in the vessel by what issues out, you possess a good plentiful store of dirt and poison in your breast, and Though I would by no means lessen or disparage your genuine stock of either, yet I doubt you are somewhat obliged for an increase of both to a little foreign assistance. Your inherent portion of dirt does not fall of acquisitions, by sweepings exhaled from below, and one insect furnishes you with a share of poison to destroy another. So that in short, the question all comes to this. Whether is the nobler being of the two, that which by a lazy contemplation of four inches round, 
by an overweening pride, which feeding and engendering on itself turns all into excrement and venom, producing nothing at last but fly bane and cobweb, or that which by a universal range, with long search, much study, true judgment, and distinction of things, brings home honey and wax. And so in summary one, and excerpt one. Summary two. On a warm Saturday morning in 1964, a hair salon sits nestled between a hardware store and a popular fireworks stand on an unnamed street. Outwardly peaceful, inside the tiled floors mark the lines of battle, and by day's end, there will be ashes. The salon is opened hours earlier than usual by a young man who would just as soon not be up so early. This man makes his living by sweeping cut hair between, ha between chair stations and providing the salon's gum machines and radio with technical support. He pays special attention to the cleanliness of two chair stations deliberately positioned on opposite sides of the small salon. These are the workstations of the two most popular stylists and notorious hair rivals in town, referred to here as EM and SP. The man wonders which will be out of a job by the end of the day. But I'm sorry, the man wonders which will be out of a job by the end of the week. The salon owner has promised to take on the victor of tonight's battle as salon co-owner. EM and SP enter the salon as if conjured by the man's thoughts. EM worships at the fashion altars of Rita Hayworth and Ingrid Bergman, specifically between 1942 and 1949, and is morally incapable of creating a hairstyle antonymous to that time. She draws a significant following from the town's population of mothers, a fact most apparent on afternoons when nearly each one of, wants, each one of them wants her hair curled for the evening's PTA meeting. SP, meanwhile, worships the fashion of the moment. SP's current obsession is Jackie Kennedy's mourning period look, and all things Sophie Loren. Her following came from the town's her following comes from the town's and she preps her station today with steely confidence. Tonight is prom for the graduating class of 64, and SP was taking walk-ins. But it was anyone's game because so was EM, and she had never been let down before by the Mother's Chaperones for Ladies High School Committee. Kids pass through the salon styling chairs, daughters sticking to one side and mothers to the other. Like their stylists, the generation gaps do their best to ignore each other. There is excited chatter and giggling, hair flies amidst the sharp crack of turning magazine pages, and all the while EM and SP tally the other's successes and failures. So intense is their focus that no one notices the group of small boys playing with, fire, with firecrackers just outside the door. A sparkler ignites on a trail of hair, and in an instant almost all the hair in the salon, including on the women's heads, is fizzled to a crisp. After the fire department leaves, the salon is closed. During that time, both the EM and SP move out of town, and the man who opened the salon that fateful morning wonders just who would have won the battle if not for the firecracker. Followed by the excerpt, uh, which is accompanied by I Me Love Instrumental, which is performed by the Beatles in 1964. Maybe their big sisters were inside and had them sore. Though I've never known a 12-year-old boy who needed a reason to set big sister's hair on fire. Or maybe it was one of those cries for attention like you read about in the newspapers. The psychologist explains that the bank robber has a, neg a neglected childhood, and that's why he did it. There were plenty of mothers inside the salon when it happened. One might have been neglecting and getting her up due at the same time. I suppose it's possible. Or maybe that's just the risk you run when you have a hair salon right next to a fireworks stand and the boys' mischief was purely accidental. All speculation, of course. But when a scene like that unfolds before you, it gives you pause and makes you think. 
It makes you wonder how in hell so awesome and awful a thing came to happen. First was the smell. No, first was the pop. Then came the smell. I went over it with the fire chief a dozen times. Can't Buy Me Love was playing on SP's radio, and those girls were tapping their feet and giggling, and Perry Como was singing radio on EM's side. So you could barely hear the first color go off. Honestly, I wasn't watching the door. I was watching the mirrors. EM and SP were shooting daggers at each other with their eyes in those mirrors. But after the smell hit, everything happened in seconds. I blame the hairspray. That stuff lights worse than petrol. Girls started screaming and hitting their heads with magazines. And of course, that only made it worse. By the time the last of them runs out the door, the first of the husbands and daddies and boyfriends are running in, yelling and screaming. And then the fire department comes. Only ones who never left the shop were EM and SP. I was running out past them, but they're just standing there, still facing the mirrors on the separate sides of the salon, still staring at each other. You know, I think their eyebrows sizzled off and they didn't even notice. And that concludes excerpt two for summary two. Excellent. This is an interesting, I mean, there's lots to say. I was taking, I was taking a lot of notes. I think I have an echo. Is that better? Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe. Okay. There's a bit of an echo. Um, but just because, uh, you know, uh, politics kind of recently um, lit up again, so to speak, uh, yeah. with the, the California primaries and uh, and things are, are shifting away from current, you know, from the historic things, that um, divisions that we've had of, you know, Republicans and Democrats and towards other terms like left and right and this sort of eternal battle that just consumes itself <laughs> in the end in total destruction, which is, I'm sure, what will happen to this country. Um, so to, um, the first one, you have the, um, uh, a battle between uh, the ancients and the moderns, and it has these various shifts, right? So first we, we have um, a nation whose elites, whose lettered elites, we would say, are are squabbling in their ivory towers, uh, much to the indifference of the rest of the population, about something that would seem to be uh, merely uh, intellectual and not necessarily affecting. And then there's a, a second shift to this, like the fan. So th- that's, I guess, the first sort of allegorical rivalry or or tension. And then there's the second shift. Uh, to books and the books themselves and this is sort of the, like the fantastic twist uh, the books themselves get into this tussle and there's ink and and spines flying and which is very even more violent when you use it in the context of books I guess and uh, and then so like there's like this tempest in a teacup and then within that tempest in a teacup there's another little tempest in a teacup and then there's like a almost like a t- tempest in a thimble and that's actually where all the the drama takes place in the sort of concentric circles that you've set up where you have um you have in well people they're not both insects i don't think a spider is technically an insect i'm not sure no cuz it has eight legs okay yes yeah, so they have to have six or something to be uh, i think so Four or six. Well, what about centipedes? They're an outlier. <laughs> it's just like a tomato is a berry and no one cares. We're still going to call it a vegetable. <laughs> so then you have this, you know, these these tiny little little creatures. We'll we'll call them we'll call them insects because this is not a this is not a science podcast. And. Uh, so you have the the spider who represents, um, interestingly enough, the the moderns, and he represents the moderns because he has built a fortress. And all of a sudden, it kind of shifts away from like the the ancients and the moderns, and towards something that's like more primitive. Or on the one hand, you have this this tendency or this this creature that constructs and builds fortresses and 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 establishes itself and establishes its power with possession and uh, defense and is also kind of violent. Um, and then, it, uh, and you have these great, you know, uses of, of things like thrice and, and thither and a uh, confounded pickle and uh, all these, uh, what a confounded pickle. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's 
such a great phrase and so so relevant to these our times um and so on the one hand you have the the spider who's who's ensconced in his in his fortress and and then you have the bee um and then if the fortress is associated with with modernity with constructing uh, constructing things that last and the bee interestingly is associated with i guess the ancients um which i guess like my first question before i go all the way through it is like is there do you think like an allegorical consistency between each level so you have moderns versus ancients among men. You have moderns versus ancients between books because it is a bookish battle. Then you shift to the natural world. Does it still reflect this tension or does it become something else? I think it can be representative uh, and still work because you, you can look at it. What I, I don't know. I can't remember who came up with it, but... What is it that, that modern knowledge is you're standing on the shoulders of giants, which are the ones that came before you? Newton. And if the ones that came before you were the ancients, and you have them developing philosophy that's based on the natural world and just their powers of observation, really. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of freedom there, perhaps symbolized with the bee and, and living out in the wild that is contrasted by the spider and his fortress and his web. Interesting. So instead of an increasingly... Uh, marginal margin you have we're actually approximating the essential nature of the question which is like i guess yeah everyone's relationship with with nature where nature is resituated at the at the yeah it was isaac newton who said that there you go um, so um and then so so the spider and this is this moment i really like because it also makes me think a little bit about well i liked it because it was it was hilarious um, but also because it makes me think a little bit about uh, contemporary politics where the spider, what is it, what is the phrase, swelled into the size of the disputed. So he just becomes big, as he becomes bigger and bigger, he seems to increase his sense of victimhood. <laughs> Which makes me think of the internet <laughs> and people on it. <laughs> <laughs> the more voice you have, the more your voice is expressing uh, trauma and victimhood. I, so anyway, I, I thought that it was kind of a, a clever little tongue-in-cheek thing that, that suggests that maybe this is a, a phenomenon that predates the uh, the interweb. <laughs> <laughs> so then you have this like this sort of bickering between the spider and the bee, and the spider, you know, is again representing like building and creating, you know, judgment and and construction and uh, you know, kind of a conservative in the in the almost pure sense of the word. And then you have the bee, which, who is wings and voice. And then there's this sense that it also he's associated with venom, but then bees also do build, so is it necessarily fair to, to see him that way? But I guess, um, and then is it the bee who poses the question of who is nobler, or is it the spider? I don't remember. It's the bee. It's The bee goes off on his whole monologue at the end. Okay. So the whole, he is given more, I think, talk time. B gets more talk time than the spider. Do you but, think that the the narrative identifies more with the with the B with the that little outsider who's uh, just singing his song and and free and and values liberty above all things as well, many artistic think, movements will later. I think that the the B and the spider's discussion is what really gives shape to the to the battle that's going on between the books on the the library floor so you don't really know necessarily who's the victor in the books all you have to go on is this seemingly unrelated discussion between the spider and the bee and is there is there any resolution or do we ever return or would does the story ever return back to the level of the books and then back to the level of men or does do we remain in the in the universe of the spider and the bee it concludes with the the books uh, it doesn't go back up to the men at all, um, although, well, it doesn't go back up to the men. It sticks with the books. So it, it leaves, it's, so you would have maybe in the grand scheme of this story, most of what happens is the battle itself. Mm -hmm. But what I think is more telling to concentrate on is the smaller discourse that happens between the spider and the bee and i think that gives you a more appropriate lens to look at the the battle between the books okay and then in turn the the tension yeah. you, because it's not a 
it's not a question of it being a resolvable one where one emerges as the is the true path right what you see is a a sort of essential tension that is characteristic not only of like human society but about of, of existence or something like that right uh you could <laughs> you could depending on how deeply you wanted to read into it yeah well, I think anything that sets itself up as this sort of like allegorical struggle kind of suggests that, or maybe it's just a matter, I don't know, it's interesting because I, I guess it's like the, the whole notion of history, right? Like if it starts out as the ancients versus the moderns, then the, the essential struggle would seem to be a historical struggle, like change versus perpetuation or something like that. But then once you move to the animal kingdom, you have a different set of issues at play, even though they can be related because animals don't have a sense of, his of history. So it's no longer a purely historical one. It has to become somehow more like existential or something like that. But then when you, with the, which brings it like to the second story, um, which is so explicitly historical and has these, uh, it, it, it adopts such a, in contrast to kind of this um, lofty allegorical thing that, that touches, you know, books and it touches countries and it touches great powerful families. And it also touches, you know, just, uh, essential natural reality. It's, um, it, it adopts like the, I guess in some ways, like depends on how you look at the hairstylist. Uh, I hate going to get my hair cut uh, because you have to talk to people who cut your hair and they, it's usually just kind of tedious. I find, I. Uh, but you you pick this what would seem to be like the most like banal and significant kind of petty frivolous setting for what could be presented as a, a kind of an epic notion of how we view history right so like i guess how i don't know if it's if that's really a question or just like a series of of comments but um i mean why is it so important the the decades in this. So it's 1964, the music is from 1964. Um, and then you have the modern who would be SP and the modern uh, is in the moment. So instead of, uh, so modern here just means whatever is actually in style at this particular second. In this case, Jackie, Jackie Kennedy's morning look, which I thought was a great detail. <laughs> And then you have not the ancient, but with someone who's going 20 years in the past, right? So, I mean, how do you, I guess just if you could talk a little bit more about uh, what you think the motivations are for this uh, affinity to these particular decades. And hi, guys. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. The so 40s versus the 60s, it becomes kind of a transcendental do well, it. yeah, the, the periods are big for, I mean, I'm not a historian, there's so many reasons that uh, it seems significant to me. So you have the transition in that time from everything we associate with World War II to everything we associate with, like, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I, personally, to me, there's something timeless about 1940s fashion. Um, so you still have the black and white films and... That's what I what I would think of if I was thinking of of classic fashion the the hair and the clothing and then in the sixties everything is thrown up. Hmm? The shoulder pads. Yeah, well, I mean, fashion is subjective, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's something I I don't know. So I I guess they're so close together, but to me that period does seem. They, they seem in many ways in contrast with each other, but they're, they're gener generationally close. So you still also have the, the, the generation of parents and then children. And one is raising the other, but they're so far apart. Um, and the interplay is pretty interesting, I think. I think, it's, I think it's fascinating. I think it actually works really well when you consider uh, how close they are. And I think it's just that the difference is the 50s, right? So the 50s, which is when, you know, I mean, at least in our kind of national imaginary, uh, it's like this leave it to beaver family idealism with like the cowlicks and the family dinner and, uh, or you could have the madman approach, which is like the dark side of the 50s. Uh, and everyone just drinks constantly during work, which doesn't sound that bad. <laughs> and I certainly would if I could. But you, I mean, you have this kind of like this, this sense of like things are on the up, 
swing after World War II, right, or during and after where we're becoming this triumphant global power and the family order and it's super conservative and, and all that. And then you have the 60s, which is uh, a more a decade of rebellion. So I think that actually it works really well as an ancient moderns uh, tension, even though they're only like 20 years apart. So I, I don't know, that, that part I liked a lot. Um, and then the, so then there's this kind of impossible explosion where all the hair catches a flame. Why did the story have to end in fiery death? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a battle. There's, there's definitely a, a war that's going on between the two. Mm. And the, the hair salon is located right next to a firecracker shop, which does seem like poor planning. <laughs> but hilariously poor planning. <laughs> There's a sense of satisfaction because of maybe because of the clientele and how they're described where they're, they're, they're dressing up for the PTA meeting, which as someone who's going to be at a PTA meeting tomorrow, um, it's certainly not something that you should be dressing up for. <laughs> at all. It's just something that you need to caffeinate for. Um, but uh, And then I, there's a great moment with that that I really liked with the... Um, this mutual destruction, then first it was the smell, which kind of was a great way to put the, the listener in the moment. Uh, well, if I, do I get to choose now? Yes, yes, you must choose. Okay, so, and this is tricky, this is tricky because instinctively I want to say that I recognize the first story um, as, but then I'm like, maybe you're setting me up for that. So then it's like maybe it, it shouldn't be too easy because I, I do seem like I remember something from Jonathan Swift about an ancients versus modern thing, although I've never read it because I am not an English major. And uh, and the 17th century and 18th century uh, British Irish is, is definitely a weak point for me. Like I've never read anything by Pope or, or any of those guys. Maybe it was Pope and not Swift. One of those dudes. Uh, but it seems familiar to me uh, in, in that sense. Um, but at the same time, this could be something that you're adapting because it's the kind of thing that would lend itself to adaption. Um, I don't recognize the second one at all. Um, but I could see how you could actually start there and then it would be very clever and, and tricky of you to then go backwards. Um, but I think I, I'm going to go with my intuition uh, again, even though it failed me last time, and <laughs> say that you wrote the second one and that the first one is the story that exists and the second one is the story that does not yet exist. Well, you, you got it? Yay, finally. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm one in one. That's good. Yeah, I was, so I was becoming concerned. There we go. The, the first one is by Jonathan Swift, so very well done, impressive. You even got the name. Uh, he published that, it's, it's called Battle of the Books. Oh, okay, yeah, all right. He published that in 1704. Um, it, was, it was a minor episode, which was part of, well, actually it was, it was, the smaller part was called The Spider and the Bee. And it was published in a larger part that was called Battle of the Books, which was in turn published as part of a larger part, which is called Tale of a Tub. So he did this over the course of like four years, I think. So Tale of a Tub is all of these things? Tale of the Tub includes includes the Battle of the Books as well okay. as some of the pieces. You know, the only thing that I think that I've ever, um, well, Swift, I mean, Gulliver's Travels, I've read parts of, I've never read the whole thing, but uh, the, um, the A Modest Proposal. That's the only one I've read. Yeah, he I suggested that's... the way to deal with the Irish problem is to is to eat them. Yeah, well, yeah, that was that was pretty dark. Um, but no, Swift was uh, big into satire. Actually, Gulliver's Travels, <laughs> Gulliver's Travels was published as a satire that was only later kind of seen as a children's piece. No, there's some some really great things. Actually, it's funny because again, on the topic of politics, I'm really glad that you chose Swift. It be I, I love him. He's been kind of a guy I've been reading to read more of. But um, Cody, my you know my my partner or roommate or what have you, um, has been more engaged with politics than, than I have ever chosen to be. And 
he and I was telling him one of the reasons why, and it was because there's a scene from Gulliver's Travels in which he travel he travels being Gulliver um, to a place where they elect their president based on who can walk across a tightrope the furthest, even though ruling has nothing to do with that at all. <laughs> it's like it sounds like right now. And yeah, so, but it's got some great pieces, but the the Lilliputians and and then the larger versions of the Lilliputians and the. The horses and all the different. I haven't read it in a while, but it is. I good. remember the Ted Danson movie better, actually. Oh, even though it's not a very good movie. Do you remember Ted Danson, the guy from Cheers? He's Gulliver. That, but there's a movie, and anyway, I mean, it, it ends quite darkly. It, it has a very sad ending, but there's this moment where he he goes and he meets a man who's extracting sunlight from cucumbers by squashing them. That sounds vaguely familiar, actually. I probably have seen it. I don't know. We saw a lot of strange movies. I think we saw it together. I was just older than you. Yeah. Not much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so any, what, what else? Um, so Tale of a Tub, which was written in 1704. Was it written in response to anything in particular? Well, the, the Battle of the Books, which I think that he came up with that form of exchange, but it was a big... I don't know if the right word is metaphor going on in that period where um, you're coming out of the Renaissance era where everything's about modern in the now and all of the new, new inventions that we've come up with so we no longer need to rely on Virgil and Homer and Aristotle and all the old Roman and Greek philosophers was on one side. And of course the other was all you needed were those philosophers and so those two battled. But I think that was kind of a, that tended to be a cover for a lot more relevant politics and tensions going on at the time. So they would they would pose an argument with that format of ancients and moderns was very common, but underneath it was more like modern political tensions and the conservative versus the less conservative and why. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it, Swift came up with kind of that format, I think, and it was in response to some other exchange that was going on um, again, only between a few guys that actually knew or cared about any of these topics. So, no, no, it is it is kind of I'm sure contained uh, at that point. But no, no, it's just so it's so interesting to me how I mean I I came up against this particular format more recently. I went to see um, the Life of Galileo by Bertolt Brecht. Have you ever read Brecht? Mm -mm. He's a, he's a German satirical playwright. I think he would, I'm sure he had read and, and loved uh, Swift. I don't, I don't know that for a fact. But he wrote a play extremely in, in the 30s, and then he rewrote it in the 40s, I believe, uh, loosely based on Galileo and Galileo's in discovery that the, the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. And then the response of the church who attacked him as a heretic. So it's this sort of science versus religion uh, thing, although it was actually more complex, but he uses that um, as a way more to talk about, you know, obviously like persecution because he's in 1930s Germany. So it, it's with this, this kind of, you know, historical abstract debate becomes a, a sounding board or a way to, the essay that I read about it was really interesting. Is like you can use these historical fictions as a way to take distance from yourself, so that or, or and from your immediate surroundings, so that you can think about the the issues that are affecting you from like a different angle. Um, so I mean, there's more to it, but I think it would it works well with with Swift. So then, tell me about the the second one. What would it be called? Uh, well, because and I, I like to take my inspirations from the original piece. Um, so because the Swift's piece is called Battle of the Books, I would have entitled mine Battle of the Bobs. <laughs> and they would not, but you'd have to have some reference to like two actual guys named Bob at the beginning. No, and no, 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 the, the Bob haircut. No, I know, I know. But first, but first you'd have to dismiss that association in some clever way. Yeah. Uh, but like maybe they're, yeah, I don't know, just is like an anecdote at the beginning and then that would you know, kind of like the Simpsons do, mm -hmm. where like there's elaborate lead up into what's actually like the nut of the story, but this elaborate lead up is often like just as good as the actual story. Yeah. So you'd have to deal with that interpretation as well, I think. Oh, but they, we both have a last name named Roberts. That's true. 
And then it was so, I really wanted to play it. I wish I had more time. I slacked a bit on my on my prep. But I wanted to, to play with the idea of the, the younger generation more as the spider and the older is the bee. And I really wanted to have that exchange between, I don't know, like maybe you'd have a teacher sitting on one end getting her hair cut and then a student on the other. And they would start having that, that acidic exchange and you could make the comparisons between the exchange of the spider and the bee. Um, you could do a lot with dialogue. I mean, again, this is not my my realm, and I don't necessarily feel comfortable. But I feel like there are movies about this of just conversations at the barber shop or or at the stylist. And in fact, I saw recently a silent film by um, a German expressionist from like 1920. It was like a German expressionist romantic comedy, if you can imagine something like that. And there's this great scene where these country people come into town and they go on the, you know, they, they kick up their heels and they paint the town red and they do all these things that you need 1920s metaphors to properly explain, you know, the cat's pajamas and the bee's knees, and things like that. But they go to a salon and there's all this drama because of like the waiting time where you're just sitting there and you just have this boring magazine before cell phones. And so it's a really good like scenario for dialogue, I think. So I would almost do it between like, I know. I imagine like two women with like their curlers underneath, and I imagined E and M and S and or E and M, E M and S P electronic uh, as as gay men. But I, uh, I don't know why. And then when he said she, I was like, well, that obviously makes just as much sense. But I think something about the rivalry of it seemed to have that like slightly more macho touch, but mm -hmm. in the context of a hair salon. So I mean, that's a stereotype. I'm not saying that you would have to. But uh, I just imagine like these great kind of effeminate personas who would just be like majestic and have very witty, biting, hilarious things to say to each other. Yeah, I don't know. These are, as I said, I've said before that um, these are good because you you have so much flexibility and you can leave so much unsaid. So that if you wanted to come back to it later and play with it, you have so many options with. With short stories, although I feel like I, I don't know if I'd have that flexibility if I tried to expand beyond the short story formula to like a film or a novel or something. I was I was thinking about doing something with Kafka, but then I figured you would recognize all of it, so I steered away. Ka <laughs> no, there's actually a lot of Kafka that I've not read, but he has a very recognizable tone, mm -hmm. so, and and he's is quite clever, so. I know. I think to, I think it's awesome that you took on a classic, though. I mean, because it sets the bar very high for, like, the better yeah. the writer is, and especially you read a long passage, which had a lot of like. Yeah, well, that was the other thing because I know normally we wanted to try to mimic the style, but I was like, there's no way that I can mimic Swift, especially with how. The 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 historical context and how they write. Like, for, I had to. I got the passage. Mm -hmm. Like every noun and verb is capitalized, so it's going back, saying I can't read this way, and so I mean, I was I I couldn't imitate that. I had to I had I figured the only thing I could do was make another sort of historically context piece and just try to contrast the two. Yeah, that's hard, it's like especially with with the the ver I think the hardest thing to imitate would be how they actually talk, which is one yeah. reason why Mason and Dixon is one of my favorite books is. It's a contemporary writer who writes dialogue in an 18th century, an uh, 18th century speech. Like it, it's, it's very it's consistent, and it's extremely hard. Like I've I've tried because I I love kind of like really fanciful, outlandish historical fiction, and I, I like the the richness and the opportunity that it gives you. But to do it well is very hard. Um, and so, and like, and, and then you find yourself like writing things like "Go to the devil." <laughs> You're like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, what is happening? Yeah, it's it's hard because I mean, unless you you want, I don't even. You've never actually heard it. You've heard other people read it, and you've read it, so you've heard it in your mind. But you've never you've never heard those exchanges before. I mean, unless you listen. To, I mean, and I. You can't really compare Shakespeare to Swift. This one is written like as one is written as I 
and the contributor, and the other is is actual is an actual way people spoke or formally spoke. So it's it's like when what I can't even think of an example of being able to listen to someone speak or have an exchange like this, um, even in film. I'm, I mean, perhaps it exists, but I haven't come across it. Yeah, not from that era, but I would check out Pynchon is very good. But the, what what Pynchon does, at least with Mason and Dixon, and then other shorter things, is it is that he he totally eschews realism, but he creates a parallel universe. So like Gravity's Rainbow is kind of set in the 40s, but it's like a parallel reality of World War II. And you just kind of have to intuit that. And so you have to give the reader enough clues to both associate it with a particular era and disassociate from that era enough to recognize it as fantasy. It's not magical realism, but it's something like that, basically. Mm -hmm. Like historical, a historical fiction, that, magical historicism. <laughs> <laughs> you guys create your own genres with those uh, those kinds of works, though, so that could be fun. It's just hard to to maintain with with consistency and with still being invested. So the characters have to have real problems. Like mm -hmm. they need to like have lost a loved one or have some sort of existential crisis or something that you can get on board with that, so that you can deal with all of the the rest of the things that are. That are coming at you, but uh, I don't know I like the I like the challenge of it. I actually, you know, to be honest, I for a minute I did think that you had written the Swift one, so I think that you would be. Well, I tried it. to make it sound like I, I had to read over it a bunch of times, like three or four times, before I presented it because I was stumbling over it pretty badly. Um, well, Sarah, like how do you? Thither, especially for some reason, it's very difficult for me to just work thither into conversation i should do that more but you should no no no. but like it's funny because they those when i when i was studying russian uh russian uh verbs are only they're not they're actually pretty simple but they are complicated when it has to do with motion and um and then the the prepositions that go along with them also change so the question that you ask someone like where will change and so russians really do use what we would say as thither, whither, or hither, right? To here, where are you going to, and towards over there, right? So we stopped using those, but they did exist. So like there's to da, su da, da, and like the, they actually do mean like whither, thither, and hither, but like a two-year-old will use them. So you can imagine like a little Russian two-year-old like right around being like thither, thither. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's 